We'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on engaging stakeholders and describing the program, brought to you by the AIM Local Health Project. This is a project out of the Prevention Research Center in St. Louis at Washington University and is funded by the National Institutes of Health. Its purpose is to determine the best ways to support use of evidence-based public health among local health departments. Hi, I'm Renee Parks. I'm the project manager for AIM Local Health and the host of today's webinar. This is the first of six webinars as part of the Evaluation Fundamentals webinar series. We're so pleased to be offering this series along with program-specific technical assistance for your agency to enhance your evaluation capacity. This series was developed by the Prevention Research Center in partnership with the Evaluation Center at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis and with Research and Evaluation at NACHO. This webinar will be recorded. You will receive an email within one week with the information on how to access the recording as well as the accompanying materials. We'd like to hear from you throughout this webinar, so I want to familiarize you with some of Zoom's settings. First, you'll be able to adjust your audio setting at the lower left-hand corner of your screen of the Zoom window. Please note that you are currently muted. We'll be using several of Zoom's interaction features, including chat, raise hand, which is highlighted here. This activates the raise and lower hand feature and then the Q&A panel for submitting questions and comments. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar. We will collect these and address them at the Q&A portions throughout. And then finally, I wanna show you the view options menu at the top of your screen. This is where you can adjust your viewing window. Okay, let's go ahead and put that raise hand feature to use. I'd like to see a show of hands of those who feel comfortable with Zoom's webinar feature settings. So go ahead and click that raise hand feature. Good, excellent. I'm seeing a lot of you raising your hand. Uh oh, some, some lowering their hand too. <laughs> okay, great. I think that's most of you. We're feeling pretty comfortable, great. All right, I'd like to introduce today's presenter. Nancy Miller is the Assistant Dean for Planning and Evaluation and the Founding Director for the Brown School Evaluation Center. Nancy is responsible for the design and evaluation of the Brown School's strategic initiatives and overall performance management. She has more than 20 years of experience in program and systems level evaluation, strategic planning, and organizational leadership and performance management. She is very committed to supporting organizations on their journey to strengthening their performance and in turn their impact on the communities they serve. I'm sure that's why she and her team were so willing to collaborate on this series and provide the follow-up evaluation technical assistance that will come. Nancy, I'm gonna turn it over to you to share more about yourself, the Evaluation Center, and get going with today's content. Great, thanks Renee so much. I'm going to share my screen with everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for taking time out today to um, talk evaluation, one of my favorite topic areas and, and things that I love to do most. So today I'm gonna focus on three key strategies to building strong evaluations. Um, planning process, engaging stakeholders, and of course, I think all of our favorites, logic models. Um, I am, let's see. Uh, sorry, little technical difficulty here. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna turn off my video so you can focus not on me, but on the, on the slides here, and then, and then we'll come back together towards the end of, end, end of our talk today. So let me just start by talking a little bit about the Brown School Evaluation Center. Um, 
Um, we are about four years old. We're a strategic initiative of the Brown School, which is a graduate school of social work, social policy, and public health here at Washington University. And it's really in response to our partners in the community, both within the region, across the state, and nationally, around um, assistance and training around evaluation and performance measurement. Um, and, and like I think probably many of you, um, you know, for us at the Evaluation Center, we don't like to do work just to do work, right? And so evaluation can be such an important tool in, in any um, organization's program toolbox. Um, in fact, it's really necessary um, to really understand the extent of which your public health programs are creating social impact. So we're kind of a one-stop shop for all things evaluation. Um, we, what's nice about being here at Washington University in the Brown School is that we're able to bring together content um, experts, um, methodological um, expertise, the communication piece of this, and the uh, capacity building to help support the work of our partners. Um, which are um, in the areas of public health, the social service sector, um, nonprofits, both local, state, and national, um, government agencies, um, as well as um, uh, funders and philanthropic organizations. So I'm just so happy to, to be able to um, partner with, with Renee and her team um, to talk about one of my favorite subjects. And, and I hope that many of you also find evaluation um, not so daunting, um, but, also, but, but more so a, a useful tool. So for today's agenda, um, we only have, you know, we have a little less than an hour. So I figured that I would talk today about three key strategies that are fundamental to every evaluation. Um, there's a lot more things to cover and many of the upcoming webinar, um, webinars in this series will cover those topics. So today we're just gonna start off you know, on the right foot here. And we're gonna talk about planning, um, the stakeholders, and then your visual roadmap and how to describe your program. So our goal today is really to understand the evaluation process, um, know how to identify and engage evaluation stakeholders, and learn about a tool that can help describe your program. So I'd like to just get a sense today of, of who's joined us um, on the webinar. Um, and so Renee, I'm gonna have you do the, the poll. Yeah, so we've got, I'm gonna launch the poll now. What best describes your level of evaluation experience? So go ahead and click which, currently where you feel your level of evaluation experience is um, by just clicking one of the responses there and then we'll be able to see um, who's, who's on the phone today. Um, okay, we've just got a couple more that need to, need to vote. All right, a couple more maybe. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end polling. Okay, so majority of everyone, ha they have, you've done some evaluation work, whether that is um, leading and designing, implementing an evaluation, or, or that you've participated in those activities as well. So glad to have you on board. Um, um, please, um, Renee has gone through kind of how you can ask questions and, and even provide comments. Um, please feel free to do so. Um, we are happy um, to, to have input um, as I go throughout, go throughout the content. So I just want to start by doing some level setting um, before we get into the strategies. Um, I think everyone knows this, but I wanted to cover, so what evaluation is. And evaluation, we use it Everyone uses it in everyday life, right? So um, we evaluate what schools our kids will attend, um, the type of car that we wanna buy. And it really is this, this systematic and intentional process of gathering and analyzing data to inform learning, decision-making, and action, right? It really to show the merit, the worth, or significance of something. Um, and it's useful um, for many purposes. Um, and it's really, one thing to keep in mind is I think all of you know, working in a public health setting, um, is that it's, it is influenced by real world constraints, right? Um, it's, it never goes off the way that we had intended, um, but there's still a lot of value to it. And then quality improvement is a continuous ongoing effort to achieve 
measurable improvements in, in all of those following areas. And so um, in efficiency and performance and accountability, um, and really here the goal is to reduce waste, increase efficiency and increase internal, so your employees and your teams um, um, to in increase an internal and external um, satisfaction. And so this really focuses on um, um, the system and seeks to improve the provision of services with a future emphasis on, in, on results. And so, you know, sometimes people, in terms of what is evaluation, what quality improvement is, and it really goes, they really go hand in hand together. So why do you want to evaluate? Well, um, I think, um, you know, it's, it's really to enhance programs, right? Um, we want to have better public health outcomes um, for the individuals that we're serving, for the communities that we're working in, um, to help inform decision making. Right, um, and, and part of, you know, this webinar series is part of a larger project that's really focused on evidence-based decision-making, and that's, that's where evaluation definitely comes in. Um, making the case for sustainability and scale-up. Um, a lot of times funders are asking, um, how do you know your, program, your programs were effective? Um, how do we know that we're ready for scale-up in other communities, um, in other populations? And then, and then even most importantly, I think, too, is to share your story more effectively and broadly. And, so the evaluation, the evaluation Center, we work with a number of um, nonprofit organizations, and I think one of the number one challenges they have is how can we tell our story more effectively? How can we use the results that we're gathering and really show our stakeholders, our clients, our funders, um, that we are making a difference in the lives of our families um, that we're serving? And um, it really helps to utilize your time and resources more efficiently as well. So I wanted to include this slide because I know that um, there is sometimes um, in, in the workshops that we do and the trainings that we do that there's, there's some confusion about what the difference is between research and evaluation. Um, and a lot of times funders, especially we've, we've found that some of the foundations um, uh, are, are challenged because they always, when they hear the word evaluation, they immediately think of research. Um, and I think the slide really helps to explain what, what's common um, across these two areas and then what's different, right? And so as you, you know, you see that research is really about generating new knowledge. It's really driven by the researchers and, and faculty members versus evaluation is really to inform decision making and it's really stakeholder focused. Um, and, and really where the two areas come together is in the methods and analysis, right? So we share common, um, common tools, common instruments, and common ways to collect and analyze data. And then, and then as we, we have those um, results from the analysis, we're looking at, you know, making research recommendations, publishing your results on the research side. Um, and then on the evaluation side, really uh, making recommendations based on the key evaluation questions, which I know will be covered in an upcoming webinar. And really sharing that information back to stakeholders and, and, and helping stakeholders to be able to utilize that information, whether that's for program improvement, um, to communicate the effectiveness of the program, and so on. So Michael Quinn Patton, I think, put it very succinctly, is that research seeks to prove and evaluation seeks to improve. Um, and I think that's a really easy and nice way to, to, um, to explain it to folks who aren't familiar with the, the, the role of evaluation. So in just, just a quick overview about formative evaluation and summative evaluation. So really what's important is to first identify a clear purpose and goals. What is it that you want to do um, that you want to, why, why, why are you doing the evaluation? Um, what do you want to get from, from it? And so formative evaluation helps you to improve your program, right? And summative evaluation helps prove whether your program worked the way that you planned really to demonstrate those results to a funder or to community or stakeholders. And there's definitely benefits to both. Um, and if you only conduct a summative evaluation, you, you may find that your program wasn't successful and you won't know why without a formative evaluation component. And on the other hand, if you're conducting a formative evaluation and find that all your program components were implemented correctly and as you intended, you won't know if the program has the intended outcomes without a summative evaluation. So really these two types go hand in hand. Um, and, and it's really during this planning process that you really figure out what's the right balance, right? Where are you at in your program implementation and the evolution of your program and also the evaluation? 
So one, one nice analogy in terms of formative evaluation and summative evaluation I like to use is that when a cook tastes the soup, that, that's formative evaluation. And when the customer tastes the soup, that's summative evaluation. Um, so I hope that that helps to give some context into the world of the different roles of these two types um, of evaluations and the purpose of them. And I know in an upcoming webinar, uh, I think Renee is going to be covering in more detail on that. So um, how many of you, so use the raise your hand button. If you sometimes feel like this, like this picture here, when you're thinking about how to get started on your evaluation. Oops, go back. Brene, are you able to see the? Yeah, I've got several hands going up, about, yeah. about eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, so you, I just want you to know you're not alone. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that I really love to do is to help um, teams and organizations really take that fear out of evaluation. Um, when I, sometimes when I come to a meeting for the first time with a team of, of program staff, um, they're very leery of me. They're like, oh no, here comes the evaluator. Um, they're going to tell me what I'm doing wrong in my job. And, and it's really, it's really not about that. And it's really about, um, building that partnership and that relationship during the planning process with all the stakeholders, whether you're an external evaluator or an internal evaluator, right? If evaluation's in your role and your job um, within your organization. And it, the, that's the first step is really to develop this plan and, and get the input from, from all those key stakeholders so that they have ownership and buy-in. Um, so so um, Yogi uh, Berra said it best. Um, developing an evaluation plan helps you to keep on track and lets your stakeholders know what is and is not included in the evaluation. And I know all of us experience this where things keep adding, get, getting added on, right, to a program, or let's do this and let's do this. Um, and same thing with the evaluation. If you don't have it, if you don't have a plan in place, it makes it really hard to say no when things come up, right, um, and can take you, take you off track. So your plans don't have to be very complex. They can be very simple. Um, but you do have to devote a little bit of time up front to developing the plan. Um, and if you do that, I promise that your evaluation results will yield um, useful, uh, useful findings um, and, and also will be a very good time of your resources. Excuse me, a very good use of your resources. So let's talk a little bit um, about the evaluation planning process. And this, um, we call it our planning wheel, and it's adapted um, from the CDC and from some other evaluation colleagues, Preskill and Jones. Um, and this is really the steps through evaluation planning and design um, all the way through implementation. So you really have to start um, here first in, in describing your program. Um, that is key. We work with a lot of nonprofits who have been, you know, you know, doing the work and providing the services and programs, and they really don't have, they don't have good documentation. Um, and so we really work with them to get it documented because it makes sure that everyone's on the same page about what they're doing. Um, it also helps show kind of show the theory of change, right? And so here's what we're doing and here are the outcomes that we're intending to happen. And then it goes through focusing the evaluation, determining design and data collection methods, and then you get into collecting the data. And I think a lot of programs, because of you know, time constraints and, and maybe the leadership of the organization really wants things to move fast, that the first couple steps get skipped. And it goes right to, well, let's design a survey and let's implement, let, let's, let's collect the data. Um, and that, that always, that typically does not yield good results that you can actually utilize, right? Because you haven't taken the time to really understand why you're doing the evaluation and what the purpose and focus is. Um, one of the differences that, that the CDC planning wheel and, and the planning wheel that, the that we at the Evaluation Center use is, is that they have stakeholder engagement as one of those steps. Um, and we have pulled that out and put it in the middle of, of the circle along with disseminating and utilizing results. And the reason that we do that is we, um, we, we are very strongly tied to um, that if you don't have people engaged, the people who are implementing the programs, the people who will be using the results, um, your evaluation's not gonna be as useful. 
Um, and so stakeholder engagement occurs throughout the entire planning and implementation process um, and it takes time and thought and we're going to cover some of that today to give you some ideas of how you can engage stakeholders at different points throughout your evaluation process and then the disseminating and utilizing results those that doesn't happen at the very end um, we always work to provide some preliminary findings um, do some dashboards so we can see how things are progressing um, and that really happens throughout you don't want to wait till the very end of an evaluation to, to look at look at the results um, because course corrections could happen um, anytime during that process if you're really seeing that maybe the programming Maybe there's some implementation challenges that we can address now so that we're able to really um, improve implementation and, and strengthen the delivery of the program for our participants. And then the other piece of this is the standards, the evaluation standards. And, and those, um, those help to us ensure that the evaluation activities and results um, are useful, are feasible, um, are suitable uh, to the evaluation need and are accurate. Um, and it really helps, um, you know, this helps to avoid the scenario where we have a one, a one, um, a 75 page report at the end of an evaluation that gets put on the shelf or worse yet, um, gets filed and no one takes action based on the findings. And so in real life, this is a very, uh, very complex process that we need something to guide us, to guide us, to give us direction and make sure that we're on the right evaluation path. So we ask these questions not only at the beginning when we're starting to meet with our partners, but throughout. And it helps make sure that what we're doing is going to be is feasible and useful um, and, that, and that we're following a good standard of ethics. So the evaluation plan is a living document um, that you'll monitor and evaluate your program using and, in, and in, intends to use evaluation results for program improvement and decision making. Um, it really provides that clarity um, for all of your stakeholders um, on what the priorities should be, where the resources should be allocated, and the skills that are going to be needed to accomplish the evaluation. So the plan components, um, a, a, a comprehensive evaluation plan, and I use the word comprehensive a little, um, I don't mean it has to be 50 pages. Our plans are usually maybe three pages, five pages, depending on, on you know, on the scope of the, the program or the initiative that we're evaluating, but it's going to talk about what the purpose is, who the stakeholders are, you'll have a logic model, um, you'll provide some context of your program, you'll have your evaluation methods matrix, which has your evaluation question, what methods um, are suitable to answer that question, by whom, um, and then you'll they'll do some planning around dissemination at the the very beginning of all this. What are we going to do with the results, who are we going to give them to, and how are they going to receive them. Okay, so I'm just going to pause there for a second. Are there any questions about about the overview and the evaluation basics I just went through? Feel free to submit questions in the Q&A box. There's currently no questions, Nancy. Okay, well we're going to keep moving then and get to the good stuff. Uh, all right, so let's talk about um, let's talk about stakeholder engagement. Um, and um, at the center of this process, you see the stakeholder engagement. And stakeholders really help you to tell your program story, understand and improve your program, to be accountable, to increase sustainability, and to in help inform the field. And so one of the questions um, that I have is, what is your biggest challenge in engaging stakeholders in evaluation? Do you have too many stakeholders to engage? Not enough time to do engagement? Not sure where or when they should be engaged and don't, don't know who your stakeholders are? We've got about half people, half of our attendees. Go ahead and submit. Just a couple more people. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end polling and share the results. 
Yeah, the, the, um, knowing where and when that stakeholder should be engaged is, is a big challenge for sure. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch on each of these, each of these areas a little bit um, to hopefully give you some more ideas and some approaches that you, you could um, begin to implement and, and think about as you're developing and implementing your evaluations. So again, I just wanted to um, reiterate in terms of who the stakeholders are, right? These are individuals who have a vested interest in the thing that's being evaluated and would be in the position to use results in some way. Um, people are engaged when they have a meaningf meaningful role in the deliberations, discussions, and decision making of evaluation. So I'm going to go through this, um, these, um, these questions here and, and talk a little bit about each of them. Um, so why engage your stakeholders? Um, so Haley, Haley Preskill, um, I think, said it best. It's really to increase the likelihood that findings will be used for learning, decision making, and taking action. Right? We don't want to just do evaluation to do evaluation and have the, re the findings sit on a shelf. Um, attention to stakeholders has gained more prominence, um, both for practical and ethical reasons in the field of evaluation over the past couple decades. Um, and it, involvement of stakeholders is presumed to enhance the design, implementation of evaluations, and also of strategic learning and decision making with those results. So at the Evaluation Center, our work is guided by these primary evaluation approaches, uh, participatory evaluation and utilization focused evaluation, along with another approach um, called culturally responsive evaluation, um, which I'm not going to cover today, but I encourage you um, to to explore this approach if you're interested. There's a lot um, a lot on 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 the web um, that you can you can Google and and see about culturally responsive evaluation. Um, we believe that evaluation is better if stakeholders have ownership and buy-in, especially for us being an evaluation center where you know where we work with partners. Um, you know, I, I start off by saying, you know, this is not my evaluation, this is your evaluation. I'm just here to help facilitate the process, to, to, to pose questions to you all, um, and, and to really help you get things documented. Um, and so, participatory evaluation really is, you know, the, the, the belief that evaluation's better if you got stakeholders involved, right? You know, they know the program better than I do. Um, they, bring, they know the decisions that need to be made. They understand the context, which is so critical to really being able to utilize and understand what's what you're seeing in the data and, and what recommendations you could be making to improve, improve your program or your initiative or your organization. And so that lived experience is so important. Um, and then on the utilization focus side, it's really, um, it really helps in terms of the usefulness um, and, and, and that it, if, if I, you know, evaluation should be judged on its usefulness to its intended users. And I think that's really important. Again, what I may find interesting and helpful may, may not be what the organization needs. Um, it may not answer those questions that they've been wrestling with for, um, for a year or two. And so there's a lot of benefits. And I think, I think um, all of us, you know, working in the public health field um, know about the importance of understanding the lived experience and the context um, in which not only our staff and our clients, but also within our community. So it brings really new perspectives, um, ensures quality of the evaluation, increases the cultural and contextual understanding. Um, it acknowledges the political context of evaluation. And I think that's really important because there have been times that we've been working with an organization and you know we're, we're working with them to implement their evaluation plan. And, and I don't know the organization, right? I, except for the, the relationship building I've done, but there's a lot of political context that's going on within any organization. And so those stakeholders really helped help me understand that. And it may, it may affect how I um, present, um, how I approach um, discussions with certain key stakeholders. Um, it may also provide that context and why we're seeing some of the results that we're seeing. And I think it really reduces the suspicion and fear of evaluation. Evaluation is one of the tools in our public health toolbox that we need um, and at all levels of the organization, there should be buy-in and there should be appreciation for what evaluation can provide. And so the, the way to really overcome that fear is to have people be engaged. 
So who are the right stakeholders? Well, so there's, you know, there's kind of four key, key categories, right? So those who are served or affected by the program, um, individuals who are involved in program implementation and operations, um, those folks who are funding the program, and also the intended users of these findings. So that could be any of those other three categories, or it could be some other folks as well. And so when we sit down, one of the first things we do with our partners is we sit down and we talk about who their stakeholders are. And we, we frame it in, in this concentric circle where um, at, the, at the core of that circle are your primary stakeholders. Those are the individuals who are the program staff, who are the people who need to be involved in the evaluation planning design um, process throughout. So they're going to be the folks that are in this day-to-day -day who, who um, will get the greatest value out of um, participating and, and helping to lead and design the evaluation. Then there's your secondary stakeholders. <clears throat> These people are critical, but, but they're not going to be in the day-to-day. -day. They're not going to be at the weekly or bi-weekly meetings. Um, they may not be at the logic model session. They may be reviewing a draft of the logic model. Um, many times this is, you know, kind of maybe your um, organizational leadership. Um, or a board of directors, um, those sorts of things. And then you've got your tertiary, that, that um, outside circle. And those are the folks who have interest in the evaluation, whether that's for future planning or decision making, um, but, but more, more so generally. So they may not, they probably won't participate in, in any of the meetings or the planning process, um, but would, you know, would find it useful to, to see the findings, right? So that can be other, other programs that are similar to yours, um, it, or sometimes in some cases it's the media. Um, so thinking about it as primary, secondary, and tertiary um, helps to kind of, when you, you have a lot of stakeholders, helps to start to categorize and maybe prioritize. There's no hard and fast rule about what makes an individual or group a primary, secondary, or tertiary, um, but we have some exercises that may help um, in thinking about that. So this is just a broader list um, of potential stakeholders that you may want to think about. Um, just some quick tips um, that I wanted to, to put out for you. So one, one thing is, is to avoid narrow alliances, right? And you, you want to kind of broaden this as you're thinking about initially who are all the stakeholders. Um, so be strategic and think politically, right? Um, Sometimes you, there are individuals that you absolutely have to engage because it's politically smart to do so. Um, use the data to identify those affected by the program. Um, don't avoid individuals who may challenge the status quo, right? Um, it, it's not, it's, although it's, it's sometimes hard to manage or facilitate those individuals, um, people who may not be your biggest fan may actually um, be really important as you're designing, implementing your evaluation. One, it could help bring them along, right? They could get a much better understanding of what you do and why you're doing it. Um, but it also, again, having a different perspective may also help, help you all make some decisions around um, changes um, or, or things, um, things to think about in a different way. Um, engaging community-based organizations as an alternative to individuals who may be hard to engage. So sometimes, you know, engaging your clients um, throughout all this, maybe, you know, one, you know, it, it's, a, it's a time commitment um, in some cases, even if you're doing your best to really reduce that burden. But, you know, many times clients have other, they have other worries and other challenges that are, you know, that are much more um, priority for them. So some of the organizations that you may partner with um, or networks may be good folks to engage, right, because they're also working directly with the same individuals and can provide that more lived experience um, perspective. And then using existing mechanisms like advisory boards to gather information as well. So key questions to consider, you know, <clears throat> as you're continuing to identify your potential stakeholders, you know, do the stakeholders represent a mix of perspectives, experience, roles? Do they reflect diversity um, in terms of race, age, social, socioeconomic status, or other important characteristics? Are there organizations or individuals who are missing? Who has the most interest in the program? And who has the most to gain or lose from the evaluation? So what are the stakeholders' roles, importance, and motivation? Um, stakeholders, stakeholder input, right? So they bring, if you look at the, on the left-hand side of your screen, you know, they 
bring a lot to, to the table, right? They bring expertise, they bring influence, they bring lived experience, buy-in support. And really having that broad, having a broad set of stakeholders that are bringing that to the table really helps in a, developing a good evaluation questions and a very strong de design, which then lead to evaluation findings that are useful, credible, and relevant. Um, so, so taking some time up front to really think through who your stakeholders are, are really, is, is really a critical step in this. So this is one tool that we use, and, and actually after the webinar, Renee will be sharing this document. There's there's more there's more um, there's more do, uh, pages to this document, but this is this is one of the tables that we um, have our partners sit down and, and fill out, um, you know, either as a group or individually, and come together to, to have some consensus. Um, but across the top, you'll see this is an example from a community youth garden, a community garden. Um, a group that we worked with and so they have garden staff and community leadership and donors and youth and employment organizations and residents as their kind of main stakeholder groups and then they ask this first question is what does each stakeholder bring to the evaluation you know is it just interest do they have diverse perspectives expertise so they went through this exercise <laughs> and checked the boxes that made sense for each stakeholder and then the next question is, how important is it to have their perspectives and experience represented? Because you probably have a lot of different stakeholders, and I know that's one of the challenges. Like, I have so many stakeholders, what do I do with all of them? Well, again, you have to do some prioritization because you, you don't want to spend all your time managing the stakeholders, right, and communicating with stakeholders. You're not going to be able to get the evaluation done. And so um, thinking about who's vital, right, who is vital to the evaluation success and resulting use of findings. Um, which stakeholders are important, right? So they're important to include for practical or political reasons. And then which set of stakeholders are nice to include if we have the time and resources. Um, and that prioritization helps, right? Because it's really those vital people that if you have very limited time, that you've got to make sure that you're engaging with them on a regular basis in a lot of different ways. Um, and so it, it, it should help um, uh, kind of prioritize your time and, and where you really need to focus. Um, and, and those folks that are nice, you know, that you've checked the, the nice box is, you know, maybe they don't need to hear from you every month. Maybe they're good hearing from you maybe every six months or when there's some major findings. Um, but those vital people need to be hearing from you on a much regular basis and need to be more engaged um, in, in the evaluation. And then the last uh, row is what may motivate the stakeholders to participate. So it's important to really understand um, um, what, why, why would they want to be at the table? Why would they want to, to engage with you? And, and so this helps in the, your communication with them and your messaging with them. And so thinking about, you know, well, there's a commitment there. So of course, program staff are going to have the strong commitment. Um, for some folks, there's a personal stake in this. Um, maybe having them engaged in the evaluation is, is more, or professional development opportunity, right? So in this case, in this example, really have, have, having the youth engaged in the evaluation planning and implementation process um, was good. Like we had just a couple, you know, not, a, not every youth that part, um, participated in the garden, but a few that showed some interest. Um, thinking about income. So again, you know, youth were paid um, for, for the data collection, um, but also like income if you have researchers or um, other consultants right so this is one of the reasons they're motivated to be at the table so I think it's good to understand that um, um, to understand that as as you go through and identify your stakeholders so when you're prioritizing prioritizing I would recommend that you keep the prioritization confidential right just internal you don't want to share this document um, with all your stakeholders because some of them might be offended that they're only you know they're not vital um, um, so and that program beneficiary should be considered vital or important, right? So those folks that you're serving, they, you know, they're not, it's just, it's not nice for that just to, they're not just, well, we can maybe if you have time, but keeping those, them centered at the forefront. Um, and get input from your colleagues. So a lot of times, like I said, organizations will have a couple people fill us out and come together and come up with one final assessment of their stakeholders. And when determining motivations, think about if compensation's needed, um, the need to build networking opportunities across your stakeholders and their interest in, in availability, 
right? So everyone's busy and how best can you utilize their time? So how do you keep stakeholders engaged? This is like the million dollar question um, and it is so important. Um, and so Richard Beckhart, um, he's a pioneer in organi organizational development and really people affected by change um, must be allowed to allowed active participation and a sense of ownership in planning and conducting um, the change or the evaluation. Um, and I think this quote, people support what they help create is so true. And I think all of us have experienced that um, both in our professional and personal, personal lives. Um, but there are things that you have to think about, right? And the process by which you engage is important. Um, so this is a list of key criteria to consider when identifying how, how you will facilitate engagement of your stakeholders. You know, your timeline. Do you have the time to have multiple in-person meetings with the same stakeholders? Or are your stakeholders spread across geographic locations and we require a fair amount of resources to, to bring them all in to the same, to the same spot? Um, maybe it's more virtual engagement. Um, how well do most of your stakeholders know each other? If they don't know each other well, will you need to build in time and facilitate a process that will give them an opportunity to learn more about each other? The number of stakeholders, right? Facilitating the engagement of eight stakeholders is very different than an ongoing engagement of 25. So you may think of points to engage the larger group and other strategies for developing a deeper dive with a subset or smaller number of stakeholders. And then the familiarity with the evaluation. You should also consider how familiar all your stakeholders are with the evaluation. For meaningful engagement, you may need to do a little education around evaluation and, and providing that, that foundation so they understand what evaluation is, the benefits of it, and so on. So this graphic, I think, is a nice visual to help um, kind of match um, whether group in-person or virtual meetings um, um, and one-on-one and -on -one meetings. So if you have a short evaluation timeline, obviously doing things virtually saves time, right? Um, if you have limited budget, same thing there. Um, if, if there's a lack of existing relationships um, among your stakeholders and it's really important for them to build that rapport, then in-person meetings, um, group meetings or one-on-one -on -one with, with you as the evaluator um, will be helpful. Um, so this is, this is just a, a kind of a quick um, uh, overview um, for you to think about what challenges you have and, and what, what methods may be helpful in addressing those. And the one other thing I want to say is there may be points during the evaluation that you have less access to stakeholders. For example, we just recently facilitated an evaluation question identification process <coughs> with a group in Kansas City, and we did that virtually. Um, but due to limited time and geographic spread of the stakeholders, so there was folks in Kansas City, there was folks in Arkansas, and, and a couple of folks, uh, I think, in, in Minnesota, um, we decided to get input about having them prioritize their evaluation questions through a, through a survey. So they came together, um, it was like a four hour virtual session, very interactive, but then um, we sent out a survey and it had them rank um, the evaluation questions. And that worked really well for them um, and it was much more efficient use of, of their time. So this, this matrix um, is, is also helpful in terms of this power interest grid, right? So um, you've got the power on the left hand side, so low, low power up to high power, and then along the bottom you've got the interest level, right? So low to high. And so for each of these boxes, you can plug in specific individuals, right? <coughs> and determine, um, you know, who's got high power but low interest. So we need just to, we need to communicate and engage them to keep them satisfied, but maybe it's not a full board press. Um, those people in that top right-hand corner are really important. They've got high interest, they have high power. We really have to manage that engagement closely and make sure that we are meeting their needs in terms of sharing of information and getting their input. Um, so this is also a useful tool. Um, and again, I think that this is done, if this multiple folks on your team can do this and come together, I think it's helpful to see what, where you guys agree on and where the differences are and talk through that. So stakeholder engagement throughout the evaluation process. Um, here are some ideas. So when you're in the planning phase, 
um, involve as many as many stakeholders as you as you possibly you know as you can. That 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 that's realistic, right? So you may have an evaluation advisory committee that you've identified and have good uh, representation and diversity on that committee to engage. They can assist with a assessing your organization's readiness for evaluation work. And there is a tool um, called ROLL. Um, and if you Google that, it'll come up that Prescott and Tories did. That's really a nice uh, tool to assess whether or not your organization is ready for evaluation work and what, it, what, it, what may need to happen to get it ready. And then also describing the program. So that planning phase with the logic model. Um, they can also assist with the design, right? By attending, by identifying intended users and use of the evaluation, um, identifying and prioritizing those evaluation questions and helping with the selection of indicators, methods, and the appropriate design. For implementation, um, assist with identifying the sample, collecting meaningful data, interpreting the findings and developing recommendations. Um, they also may be able to facilitate access to participants and clients. The reporting piece of this um, assists with translating results in a clear and understandable way, identifying dissemination channels, and communicating the findings in a variety of formats for different audiences. So again, it's really helpful for us when we're, we bring <coughs> preliminary findings. Um, we like to have data parties. Um, and so this is, we've done a first round of analysis. We're bringing it back to the stakeholders. They're looking at it, we're, they're telling us what, what's, what jumps out at them, what, what's missing. Um, they're starting to identify recommendations based on it. Um, so it's really a great way, um, and it really feeds then into what the reporting looks like, whether that is a report or a PowerPoint or a one-pager. Um, so it's been really helpful for, for that level of engagement with the stakeholders. All right, so the last strategy is the visual roadmap and the logic models. Um, before I move on, are there any questions about stakeholder engagement? There haven't been any submitted, Nancy. Okay. okay. Well, then we're going to keep rolling here. So now we're describing the program. So you have identified your stakeholders, you're bringing them together um, and, in a logic model session um, to help document the, the program. Um, so when you're doing this, you want to look at your program plan, right? The needs, the goals, and objectives, and creating a logic model, which is a visual roadmap of all the work that you're doing and the outcomes that you are intending to achieve. So it's a very simplified picture, and it shows the logical relationships among the resources that are invested, the activities that take place, and the benefits or changes that result. I want to just briefly um, talk about, there's... Um, Sometimes people are confused with the theory of change and logic models. Um, and so this slide shows how they're different. Um, and really, the theory of change really asks why, right? Um, and the logic models ask who. So um, typically, a, a, a theory of change isn't fully articulated, right? It's got assumptions and expectations that then drive, um, that then drive the, the activities that are being done. Um, logic models really make the implicit explicit, right? So it, there's an underlying theory of change, but it really is used for program development, planning, and evaluation. Um, um, they can be applied to a number of things. So it's not just programs. It could be organizations. It could be a process. So really, what is invested, what's done, and what are the results? And so very simple example, right? You have a headache. So you get the pills, you take the pills, and you feel better. Um, and it really, this is the, the, it portrays this chain of reasoning that links investments to results. So the benefits of this, it really identifies important variables to measure and more effective use of evaluation resources. It provides a reporting framework. Um, it focuses on accountability. Um, one of the things when we bring our stakeholders together to do a logic model session is I tell them one, to trust the process, and two, that, sometimes, that the process is, is as important as the actual final product of the logic model. Getting, getting that diverse perspective in the room, um, we have seen time and time again where um, one individual may be thinking, well, I thought we were, we were trying to achieve this outcome, and the other individual is thinking, well, no, we're doing this. And so everyone touches a 
different part of the elephant. And so it's really helpful for teams to make sure they're on the same page and develop a common language um, uh, around what they're doing. So I'm just gonna quickly go through the different components of a logic model. Um, it's a series of if-then statements, right? So if we have these inputs, then we can do these activities. If we do these activities, then we'll see these outcomes. So the problem statement or goal. Um, at the top of your logic model, um, you should have at least one of these. We like to frame it in terms of a goal, but what sometimes people frame it as a problem statement, the intended aim or impact of a, over the life of a program. So here's some tips. Um, all your components should be connected to that, that overarching goal. And you really want one clear goal. Um, other goals may turn into more long-term long outcomes. So here's just a couple examples um, of, of some goals that we've pulled from logic models that we've done. Increase the, improve the health status of children in Harris County. Um, assess, assist clients in their efforts to becoming economically self-sufficient. So the inputs are really your resources that go into the program. And so there are some examples around time, money. Um, we like to organize and have our clients think about four different types of inputs, right? So financial resources, physical resources, human resources, and knowledge resources. And giving them that kind of framing helps them to identify more specific outputs, or excuse me, inputs. And here's some examples on the screen for you. So some tips, list the resources you currently have to support your program, um, organize them in the resource categories, and be specific, but don't spend a lot of time developing a detailed list of actual or anticipated program um, expenditures. So here's, a, here's give you um, in terms of home buying, right? So not specific enough, the just right column, and then too specific. Um, one of the things you, you don't want your one, a logic model should be on one page. So if you have, it, if it goes on to a second page, that means you've got too much detail there. You really want to make it um, a much higher level um, document. Um, activities and outputs. What, is pro, what does the program do with the resources? And then what are the direct outputs? The tangible, um, the tangible things that come from the activities. Um, so here are some common types. You're developing products, you're providing services, you're building infrastructure. Um, it's helpful to group related activities together by category. Um, so it could be capacity building, it could be direct services. Um, it, it provides, and it also provides an outline for a work plan. Um, and that's, that's helpful as well for implementation. So here are some example activities around the home buying. Again, too much detail, not enough detail, just right. Um, make sure your outputs have activities and resources associated with them. <clears throat> um, they're often quantified and qualified in some way. So here's some example of outputs. And then here's some more specific examples of activities and outputs. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move along to get to the outcomes since we're almost out of time. So outcomes, really, short-term, short intermediate, and long-term. And th thinking about it as a chain of outcomes. So short-term, what do you expect to occur immediately or in the near future? What changes do you want to occur after that? And what changes do you want to occur over time? And so we think about short-term as changes in learning. So changes in knowledge, changes in skills. Intermediate outcomes are really the behavior change or the act actions, the actions that are happening as a result of the short-term outcomes. And then the long-term outcomes really are, are the changes in condition. <clears throat> so changes in learning, new knowledge, increased skills, attitudes, opinions, values. These are the things that happen immediately after participating in your activities. They're, they're most closely influenced by the program outputs. Intermediate outcomes, again, modified uh, changes in behavior or practice and decisions. This is where policy change would happen. And it really links between your short-term and your long-term outcomes. And then long-term are really changes in the condition. Um, so human, so oppression, so there's some examples. Human, economic, civic, environmental, right? So there's a lot in terms of reduction in morbidity and mortality. Um, and so life saved. Um, and so these are really the long term, these take many, many years to see, 
um, and and what you reasonably expect to influence. So this is just some examples of uh, short, intermediate, and long-term outcomes that you can look at. And then you really want to clarify the who or what will experience the intended change. So again, look, thinking about the social ecological model, the individuals, the family or community outcomes, organizational outcomes, or the system change outcomes. The last piece of this is around your external factors. And so external factors are things that you, you have no control over, but that will impact your program, whether it's implementation or your outcomes. Here are some examples of this. So political climate, changes in policy. Um, it's good to recognize what potentially your influent environmental factors are. Um, again, you may not focus your evaluation on it, but it's good to understand that these are things that are beyond your control. And then your assumptions are really the beliefs about your program. Um, and so, um, um, they're similar to external factors in that they can impact all the areas of the logic model, but they're the beliefs about how change occurs in your field and with your specific clients. So there's there are some examples of assumptions that we've pulled from other logic models. Um, I, we've already talked about how you read a logic model. I will tell you there's a lot of different ways to do a logic model. Um, you can Google it and see a variety of different formats. Um, the biggest thing is make keep it simple. Um, and make it so that your mother could read it and understand it. I'm not going to talk about reverse mapping or forward mapping. It's, it's where you want to start in developing your logic model. Do you start with the outcomes or do you start with your inputs and activities? And so this talks about reverse mapping and I know in terms of program planning that's where we always start with the outcomes first and what we want to, the change that we'd like to see. And then here's two examples of uh, logic models that we've done for partners. So I wanted just to share those with you. You'll be able to look at those more closely with our slides. Okay, so we went through um, the planning process, the stakeholder engagement, and then logic models as a way to describe your programs. Um, so now let's turn it over to, um, for questions. We have a couple minutes left. Yeah, Nancy, I think there was a little confusion on, um, you know, creating a logic model. Is it is it creating a logic model for the program or is it a unique logic model for this evaluation plan? So, so logic models, um, logic models describing your program. Um, and so logic model can be used as your first off just designing a program a lot of times we work with partners who aren't yet at a, the evaluation stage they're in the program design stage and so we'll work with them to design a logic model for their program um, and that's their visual roadmap of what they want to do and the outcomes they're hoping to achieve and so it has a dual purpose great thank you um, right now there's no other questions so I think um, we can probably wrap up. Um, we really appreciate you guys participating in this webinar. We hope you join us for the next live webinar on Wednesday, August 21st, covering evaluation questions and designs, as well as the other webinars that are part of the series because the concepts build upon one another with the goal of equipping you with greater skills and confidence um, towards enhancing your program's evaluation plans. As I mentioned in the beginning um, of this webinar, your health department, like teams or groups associated with a specific program, are eligible to receive some evaluation technical assistance after completion of webinars one through four, um, and of course, eventual completion of webinar six. So you really could take advantage of this opportunity as early as September, the end of September, um, through the end of the project, which is February of 2020. So don't miss out on this opportunity. Thank you all again for joining us. Um, please take a moment to complete the post survey that will come up as you exit. This concludes our webinar. Thank you.